everyone, Kathy the Vegan Prepper here, and let's go ahead and talk about a couple things. <laughs> do, 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 do. Vegan Prepper. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Vegan Prepper. Today we're going to be talking about a back injury and lice. <laughs> this whole video is going to feel slightly like an overshare. Um, at least it feels that way to me. I, I'm not attempting to be gross or shocking, but I feel like I do want to go ahead and share a couple things just to potentially help some people out. Uh, so first of all, <clears throat> excuse me, let's go ahead and talk about the back injury. So my most recent video that I filmed was my herbs. Uh, I think it was like spice up your food storage is what I put on the thumbnail for the video. Uh, basically talking about spices and whatnot. So I filmed that video yesterday when my back was hurting so bad I could barely move. But I knew like I needed to do something mentally because I was going crazy. So I had Adam get my spice tote from the top of the shelf and put it on the floor so that I could film without having to move my big spice toast so that I could show everybody. Um, but one of the things that has been really helping me is white willow bark tincture. So I wanna talk about that because I make it myself. Um, and I think that tincture making is a really great skill for anybody to have. Um, it isn't just, you know, fun, experimental, herbal, like woo woo. But I mean, even if it were, don't poo poo the woo woo, okay, it is some good stuff. So <laughs> I would say, you know, it's fantastic. People think it's not effective. I mean, this, this was medicine for centuries before the, you know, standardized uh, pharmaceutical model came through. And not that I'm knocking that at all. I understand that there's some really great, um, great things that have happened. But I mean, there's also some pretty horrible things that have happened to our medicine system since that kind of super um, precise scientific model took over, um, whereby, for instance, they isolate the active, what they believe to be the active constituents of a plant. And white willow bark is um, one in really great example of that. It was kind of an accident uh, because I am meaning to talk about this today, but it's one of the great examples. Um, most people know, but just in case you don't know, the medication aspirin is taken or made basically from salicylic acid, which is the active quote unquote ingredient of white willow bark amongst other plants. It's not the only one that contains that salicylic acid active ingredient, but this is probably the most famous. And so basically this does have an effect like aspirin on the body. It can lower fevers. It can, um, help kind of keep your blood flowing if you need it to it, and also reduces inflammation and relieves pain and then just as like a, a little aside because there's actually many herbs out there that are famous for relieving pain um and it's funny that each herb or plant really does seem to have an affinity for a certain body part. So um, as strange as it may sound, white willow bark seems to be particularly effective for joints, um, knees, knuckles, especially like arthritis. Thinking of um, an inf the inflammation of arthritis, white willow bark seems to be particularly helpful for that. But it also does help kind of just like aspirin with um, general pain, headaches, and things like that. Um, it's a great kind of all-around pain reliever to have around if you can handle it. But my point, as I was saying, that um, modern medicine will isolate what they consider to be the active ingredient of a plant. Um, so oftentimes one of the side effects, for instance, of aspirin is uh, stomach aches that actually over time with excessive use, it can kind of damage your stomach lining. And it's kind of not good to take a lot of aspirin over time because that that concentrated medicine is also, like it also can kind of harm because it has been removed from its entire, uh, pro the entire profile of the original plant. So what also white willow bark contains are a whole bunch of beautiful tannins which are gentle, they gentle the medicine, they slow the absorption, they make it take longer to work, which can sound like a negative, but honestly, when you think about it, it makes it more gentle. It kind of drips into your system slowly and begins its work much more gently, much more slowly, so that you still have an effective remedy that isn't like 
smashing your pain with a hammer. You know what I mean? Like it's not, so it's definitely not like an immediate emergency thing. Like if you need immediate pain relief, you might need to turn to something that's more, um, you know, more of a like pharmaceutical thing. But for something like an aching back, like I injured my back again, um, it, it has been incredibly effective for me. Uh, and again, I just make this myself. I don't buy it. Um, it's way cheaper to make it <laughs> than it is to buy it. And so I will discuss that in just a second. But anyway, just overall, it's more gentle. It's the whole plant. So you're tincturing the whole plant. Uh, rather than trying to isolate only one part and then it ends up not harming your stomach and not giving you nausea. And you can also drink this in small doses as a decoction if alcohol is not your thing or if, for instance, um, for, for people who know that they maybe have an addiction to alcohol and they can't keep alcohol um, in their houses, which is you know, a good choice if that's something that you deal with. Definitely don't keep alcohol in your house. You can also prepare white willow bark as a decoction where you take the plant and you boil it gently in some water, usually covered on the stove for 30 to 40 minutes. And I'm not 100% sure of the ratios just now, uh, but I can put it on this. I'll look it up and I'll put it on the screen. And you also like, for instance, if you have um, really, uh, I would say strict, but I don't like the word strict sometimes because that implies um, like being unreasonable. You know what I mean? So I, I understand too that there are people who have deeply held religious beliefs that do not allow even a drop of alcohol. And so for people like that as well, a decoction is a great choice. And so you can um, do it <laughs> with the ratios that I put on the screen, um, make a decoction instead. Unfortunately, the decoction will only be good for like three to five days. Um, so you'll have to keep remaking it. One of the really wonderful advantages of doing a tincture, if you are able to have alcohol in your home or you are able to consume alcohol physiologically or, you know, because your beliefs don't disallow it, um, then another really great reason for tinctures is that they're really shelf stable. So it's one of my absolute favorite herbal preparations, especially for super long-term storage for more of a prepping situation because you have a medicine and it basically has a forever shelf life once it has been tinctured, as long as it's been tinctured correctly. So anyway, let's go ahead and talk about this. So I will let me tell you really fast how I was using it. I was taking about two droppers full every hour and that sort of started making me feel better, but I didn't start feeling a lot better until I started doing it two droppers full every half hour. And sometimes that happens like with herbal remedies, you don't take it like a pharmaceutical where you take like one or two Advil and then you have to wait for four hours before you can take it again. Or even they'll say sometimes, right, that you have to, to switch, right, an Advil and then two hours later a Tylenol and then two hours later an Advil and then two hours later a Tylenol so that you can kind of, um, I don't know what the, what the right word is. It's like you're, you're trying to stack the timing of the medicines so that you can still take a pain reliever every two hours, but you're not, um, you're not taking it too soon. Even though still again, over the counter pain relievers are very damaging to your liver, liver and your body over time. So I think knowing about this stuff is really great. So like I said, I started taking two droppers full every half hour and that is when I started feeling extreme relief. And so that is definitely not something that you would keep up for a really long amount of time. But when you're dealing with kind of an acute situation, sometimes you do take a bit higher dosage of your herbal remedies and that helps you get through your acute situation and yeah, things start getting better. So I actually had filled this bottle up a couple of days ago and it's down to here because I have, like I've said, I've been taking it and it's just been giving me so much relief and I'm almost better now after only like a half a day when typically it takes a lot longer for me to get better when something like this happens. Uh, so how do you make it? It couldn't be easier. I wasn't planning on doing a demo and honestly, I'm still kind of hurting. So I don't really want to like take the time to set it up. Honestly, even sitting in this chair, um, I'm beginning to feel a little sore again. <laughs> I kind of need to go relax a bit, but I'm gonna try to get this done um, and just sort of describe it for you. It's so simple. So I love the book, Making Plant Medicine by Richo Check. It's right there, but I can't reach it. So <laughs> I'm gonna link it down below. It's like, I'm so pathetic right now. <laughs> I can't reach it. I'm like, 
I can't even lean to get it. So anyway, um, it's called Making Plant Medicine by Richo Check. It's an excellent, excellent book on making plant medicines with ratios and kind of exactly how you do it, the formulas involved. Um, and so his basic mathematical dry herb tincture formulation, uh, because there is a difference between whether or not you're using fresh or dry, and it's very important. Don't, don't, not pay attention to that. When you're tincturing a fresh herb, you need a hi much higher alcohol concentration than when you're tincturing a dry herb because the fresh herb will begin to release water into the tincture itself. And if you don't have a high enough alcohol ratio at the beginning to offset the addition of the water through the maceration process, that's the, like the soaking process of the tincture, there can be, there can end up being too much water in the tincture for the alcohol to be an effective preservative. Hopefully I said that well, and that wasn't super confusing. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I don't explain things very well, but yeah, it's like you, you need a certain ratio of alcohol to preserve the tincture. Um, and so yeah, with fresh herbs, you need a higher concentration of alcohol. With dry herbs, you can use a lower concentration of alcohol. So anyway, the, basic formula for making a dry herb tincture is one part dry herb by weight to five parts alcohol by volume at a 50% alcohol to water ratio. A 50-50 alcohol basically is what you're looking for. So the perfect ratio can be achieved with vodka. Um, and so that, that is just naturally, that's a 100 proof alcohol. It is a 50, 50 ratio. The proof label on an alcohol is, um, if you cut that proof number in half, that's the percentage of alcohol in the, um, whatever prepared spirit that you're using. So with vodka, because it's 100 proof, cut that in half, that's 50. That means it's 50% alcohol. Um, I believe rum is usually like, no, not rum. Um, brandy is like 80 proof. That means it is 40% alcohol. I actually used to do all of my dry tinctures with brandy. Um, I have never used vodka because it's too expensive. Um, I can't afford to tincture at the level at which I tincture using vodka. Um, and so basically what I have done and what always works very well for me, it creates an extremely effective medicine is I use rum. So I picked this up at Costco. Unfortunately, it's not organic, but again, I can't afford to tincture at that level. Um, my friend and I, because we do live in a place where um, we can ship alcohol to ourselves, like the super, super, um, like the ethanol, or not ethanol, but like it's, it's really high, high proof. It's like 198 proof. So it's almost 100% alcohol. We do live in a state where we can have received shipments of that alcohol, but not everybody has that option. So she and I kind of want to go together on a couple of gallons of organic alcohol in that way so that we can get it shipped to us and then begin to do much more precise and then even some fresh herb tincturing. But I do all dry herb tincturing at this point because I mainly have access to this. And this is what I use. Um, it is 46% alcohol because it's 92 proof. Um, just an original spiced rum from, from Costco. And I'm pretty sure most rums are um, 92 proof. So you have an alcohol that is 46% alcohol, 54% water. And it does seem like that is plenty close enough to the perfect 50-50 ratio. I wish I could use a 50-50 ratio um, alcohol like a vodka, but like I said, it's just way too expensive. So if I'm remembering correctly, this is like 16 or $17. Um, and a vodka, not even this size is like $50 in my area. It's, it's much more expensive. So this is much cheaper and a, and a much better way to get into tincturing if you decide you want to do this. And then also it's really fun to load your cart and Costco up with like four things of rum and go through the store and have your daughter in the cart and have people kind of giving you looks like, what is going on here? Why is she buying all of this rum? <laughs> Like it's because I'm stressed. Okay, no I'm kidding. It's not. Um, it's for tincturing. I don't. I don't drink it. I don't think that it's yummy. Um, I don't personally have anything against occasional drinking, but I just sort of. I don't. This is. This has no appeal to me. So anyway, I just store it for my tincture making. Um, so I have, like I said, a 46% alcohol. Alcohol, which I think works really well. 
So for that ratio of one part dried herb to five parts um, alcohol, or five parts of the 50-50 alcohol, um, so for instance, you would start off with 100 grams, say, of white willow bark, and then do 500 milliliters of your alcohol in a jar, um, a quart jar, that will pretty much always fit. With certain herbs, you can get away with doing um, 150 grams of your herb and then 750 milliliters of your alcohol. Uh, I believe that white willow bark will fit basically up to the rim of a quart jar if you start off with 150 grams and then do 750 milliliters. But honestly, you'd be better served just doing two jars of 100 grams with 500 milliliters, 100 grams with 500 milliliters. Um, go ahead and let them sit in the jar, shaking them every now and then because shaking is an important part of the process, um, which is why I say don't go all the way to the top. I know for a fact that 150 grams of St. John's wort, for instance, will not take 750 milliliters of alcohol. You have to, you have to split St. John's wort. It has to be made, you know, better. So I, I would say maximum in a quart size jar, don't go more than 100 grams of dried herb um, and then do your 500 milliliters of alcohol. So hopefully that's not like way too long. Um, if you have more questions, please let me know. But seriously, get the book. Um, making plant medicine by Richo check. It's incredible, but yeah, just being able to have, um, tincture on hand. So like I have this bottle almost like with my spices, I have levels of storage, but with these, I only have two, um, that this is the one that I actually use from, you know, my, my daily dosage. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can do this. <sighs> it's not that heavy, but it's still like hard. So all of this right here is tinctures. These are my bulk tinctures that I have all I have made um, and so not all of those jars are full but those are 32 ounce jars which I bought at a local lab supply um, and those hold all of my tinctures actually I just got finished decanting a fresh well not fresh it was dry but I mean a new white willow bark tincture and I filled my bottle back up. So I only have about that much space left in the bottle of the white willow bark tincture, which is just in time because I'm using the crap out of it now. <laughs> so I sort of cycle through um, and, and make more. There seems to always be something tincturing in my kitchen. Um, and so, yeah, I, I keep meaning to go through the jars and tincture more things to, to refill ones that are kind of getting low. But that is basically the gist of the tincturing. And I, I think it's an excellent thing to have on hand again, especially as a prepper. I have some videos on tincturing, I think, in the channel, which I will find and link below some older ones that might be kind of embarrassing, but I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, so I think that that's enough on that, but let's go ahead and talk about the lice. I did mention a few months ago, my son, got lice. Um, it's just crazy. I, I, <laughs> it was a thing that completely blindsided me because I had never in over 20 years of parenting, it was my first encounter with lice. I've never seen them before. It's never been an issue. Um, I don't want to tell the whole story because this is about really kind of what we're dealing with right now. Um, I'm still very grateful for that experience, um, even though I'm, I'm horrified of what he had to go through. Um, but you know, we got him cleared and everything was good. And then Sage has started moving out and about with kids, playing, doing stuff, um, starting um, lessons of various kinds and doing more activities. I've been trying to get her out and about with kids more because she's extremely social. She is not like my older son, Elliot, she's like my oldest son, Thad. Um, very extroverted, extremely social. Elliot is kind of my little introvert. Um, he's my introverted buddy. He and I can just sit alone together in a room and read. And I know you might think that it's kind of crazy, but I am actually quite an introvert. I'm a very friendly introvert, but overall I feel like I could be alone in a house for like a whole week and I would not feel bored even one time, as long as I have like little things to do, little books to read, little paintings to paint, I will be set um, all by myself. <laughs> so it's a weird thing. Like, and I think it comes from being an only child, honestly, um, because I am, it's that weird mix of really enjoying being with people because I didn't get that growing up. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, I need my space and I need to be alone sometimes. Um, so anyway, I am, I'm quite an introvert myself. Sage is not, she is so not. So she's been playing a lot more. Um, my point, all of that. Sorry guys. Um, 
the point being, I'm, I am grateful again. It sucks that, that Elliot had to deal with it, but I, I am grateful that I did deal with it at one point because now I know the signs. So when my daughter this last week began scratching nonstop at her head, I looked and I thought, gosh, maybe we just need to scrub her head. Maybe she has like dandruff or something. And so I did wash her hair thoroughly and stuff like that, but she wouldn't stop scratching. And then I was like, are we, is this lice again? Are we seriously doing this again? And then sure enough, what I did, and I want to share this, I'm trying to share this again, not because I feel embarrassed about it. And that's the thing. Why am I embarrassed? Why is it embarrassing? It, it's something that people deal with. It's not like you're dirty if you get lice. It's just, it's something that happens. I do not know what is going on right now, but again, we, we have it, like we've gotten it so recently again. Um, and we had eradicated it from my son, but now my daughter had it and it's a very early, very early in the stages. So she caught it somewhere else. And so it's just kind of hilarious that it hit our house twice. But basically what I did was I went into her hair right by her ear, like kind of right here is where you would see, um, all the little eggs. And she had a few eggs. I saw like three or four um, on one side and then maybe like six or seven on the other and absolutely none at the base of the neck. That's the other place that you look that they like to lay their eggs is right here at the base of the neck. Um, if you're not familiar with what lice eggs look like, I would encourage you to go Google it. Um, basically, it's like if this is the hair follicle, it's like a little teardrop shaped, um, Thing stuck to the hair follicle it's a very distinctive shape once you see it you will know um, and if you have like little flakes of dandruff it's different because you can kind of go like this and get rid of a dandruff flake but with an egg if you have an egg a lice egg stuck to a hair follicle it is stuck and so you have to physically take your fingernails kneading together on the hair follicle and grab over the egg and they go like all the way down the hair follicle because they don't want to come off. They are stuck fast. And so that's another thing I think that makes them kind of a dead giveaway as far as dandruff versus a lice egg. Also, if you, for instance, maybe your, your vision isn't such that you can really see that teardrop shape when you see it because it is quite small. Um, it has a distinctive feel as well. Again, a piece of dandruff will just fly away. But if you take your finger and run it over the hair follicle, you will feel a bump that like won't move and then when you grab it and you pull it and it comes off you know that that is a lice egg so that was basically what I did I looked right over her ear and right over this ear nothing down here and I realized oh my gosh my daughter now has lice and so basically I I went after it you know with the comb we found um actually I found almost nothing but babies which again I feel is slightly encouraging maybe only one or two adults um, and then that is how I know, again, we, we were at the very beginnings of this. Um, and then my head started itching. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> and so I combed through it and sure enough, I had some too. I got um, an adult off of my head and babies. This is the part that's embarrassing. This is where it feels like an overshare because OMG, OSH, I got lies. Um, and so basically we're going to deal with it. Um, so it's embarrassing, but it is not overwhelming at all because now I've gone through it already and I know how to deal with it. Um, but now again, we are essentially, you know, we're clean people. We take our showers and we, you know, do what we're supposed to do. We have good hygiene and all of that. And this has happened now to us, um, just from occasional, apparently close proximity, um, playing. It's something that can happen. So for me personally, and the reason I'm also bringing this up on a prepping channel, I feel like everybody on earth should have lice combs in their bug out bag. Like that is to me, one of the most important things that you could possibly carry with you. Because even if you don't do a single like chemically type treatment, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, even if you don't do that, if you just physically remove the lice and their eggs, then you can get rid of them. And so basically all you need is a lice comb. The one that I have been using is not this one, but OMG OSH. Like I said, this is not, this is not my first rodeo now at this point. So I kind of know I have now 
a comb for every member of my family who has hair. Okay, my husband does have hair, but it's shaved very close. And so we're not really concerned about him. But basically, we're going to be doing checks now. Um, and we're going to be doing checks almost every single day. And if you want me to go through a full, like make a full video, just to like fully embarrass myself to death. But at the same time, I, you know, we need to be helpful. Like I've got to help people, especially if you've never dealt with it before. Some of the tips that, you know, I've, I've seen and, and kind of now I'm like, yeah, we got this. This is annoying and it's gross and it's stupid, but I got this because I've done this before now. Um, but basically, yeah, you, you have to have, you don't necessarily have to have this type. I just ordered these off Amazon. They just came in today. And like I said, I, I have three um, here and then one more um, actually currently sterilizing in the kitchen from checks that we did this morning because there's a whole process to it and you have to let them sterilize for at least 10 minutes in boiling water before you move to another head. So I get sick of waiting the 10 minutes, you know, like if we want to assembly line this thing and get like one right after the other, since we're going to be checking now and, and making sure everybody's good, I want to have more than one comb so that I can go through the process be like, okay, next and call another person over and then do it <laughs> next, <laughs> you know, do it and then sterilize all the combs at the end, you know, not have to sterilize one, you know, use one, then wait for 10 minutes and then, you know, do it again. So anyway, that is how I'm going to streamline the process for myself this time. Um, I will say that I had read all this stuff online. Like, it's like, you know, that you always say like people don't know things online, but again, I was like ignorant and brand new to the whole life thing. And I didn't really know what I was doing. So I was reading all this stuff and everybody was saying natural remedies don't work for lice. And I was like, huh, I guess, okay, okay, sure. Um, I will listen to you guys. And I'm like crunchy as heck, little herbal hippie vegan mommy over here. Like what on earth am I not, you know, so we got the lice shampoo. We did that whole, like the, everything that like everybody says you should do like, and, and I did it because I believed all of this stuff. But the lice shampoos did like nothing. Everything was still alive on my son's head. And like, it was a horrible, horrible experience trying to go through that. Also the comb that we had originally was terrible. It had teeth about this long. So I would say definitely when you get your lice comb, because I know you're going to, right? Because I've given you tips. When you get your lice comb, get ones with long teeth um, that you can actually like get in and pull, you know? Um, and make sure that you have that because the short tooth ones, in my opinion, are kind of worthless. Um, and so the long tooth ones are better. Um, but yeah, we, we went through kind of what everybody said. And then I was like, forget this. And I started looking it up again and I found procedures, um, in apple cider vinegar, basically rinse with like some tea tree oil. Um, and it was like mixed partly with water, tea tree oil, do that in the hair as a rinse at night and then do a coconut oil mask sleep in it overnight, wake up, shower, and then, you know, continually picking out with the comb, but occasionally do that rinse again, like two, three times a week. And then we eliminated the lice as we were doing it like that, like that actually killed stuff, not the stupid shampoo from the store, which is also highly toxic and full of chemicals. So if you want your lice prep down <laughs> for potential, you know, bad situations, like obviously in your own home, you can prep things like apple cider vinegar, tea tree oil, and um, coconut oil, but tea tree essential oil and coconut oil. Um, but even again, if you have nothing but this comb, you can deal with a lice infestation if you just kind of stay on top of it every day, combing the hair out. Um, you can sterilize it, but this is, again, we're kind of, I think knowledge is good. Um, honestly, the, the eggs and the bugs themselves do not live once separated from the host, which in this case happens to be you or your family. Um, they don't live for very long at all. So even if it's not possible for you to really sterilize it, if you wait a couple of days before you use it again, it might be okay. Obviously you should sterilize it, but you know, clean it out very well with an old toothbrush. Make sure there's nothing on there because again, you can physically see the eggs. It's not like they're microscopic. You can see them. Just make sure the thing is completely clean. You can let it sit if you have to. And I'm talking about a non-ideal situation here. Not like if you're at home and you can just boil water in the kettle and sterilize those things yourself. Obviously sterilize them at home. <laughs> I'm talking about like a situation for instance, um, if a flood comes through or something happens where you're all evacuated 
um, we're all evacuated. You know, we're told to get out of our houses and all we have is our bug out bags with us. And we potentially end up in, you know, some crowd of people with poor sanitation and, um, you know, stuff sort of spreads and, and all of that. Like if you're in, 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 in a situation where you end up really close to a lot of other people who have poor sanitation and it only takes one person. And again, it, life does not necessarily have to do with sanitation, but it only takes one person for it to sort of spread. And then if you find yourself itching, you have lice, you have no way of dealing with it. I kind of can't imagine how miserable that would be. So look, they're tiny. Just stick a comb in your bug out bag, okay? To deal with lice. And that's kind of my, my thing. So if you guys want <laughs> like a full video, on the lice protocol even though I don't think that what I did is special um if you start looking up natural lice you will find apple cider vinegar rinses you will find the coconut oil tip um using the comb I, I don't know that I need to go into more detail than that but if you want that video I can make that video <laughs> maybe once my back stops hurting <laughs> so anyway I'm getting a lot better um but yeah that's also why in that video I had the the cover on my hair. Um, we did, like I said, we've done a treatment and I've combed out, but it was kind of one of those things where it was like, uh, at that point I was thinking maybe I was protecting my hair, but it turns out I already had it. So um, trying to keep myself safe from Sage, too late, um, not surprising. She basically lives on my lap. Um, so I'm not at all surprised that I caught it from her and I didn't catch it from Elliot uh, because I mean, like we hug. Like there was actually stuff online that was like, don't hug your child if they have lice. And I was like, don't, like, I cannot imagine the universe in which I would stop hugging my child for like, and I was like, maybe like if they caught bubonic plague or something, but I was like, even then I'm like, I'd find a suit and hug my child, you know, like, like I, anyway, I, so anyway, I was still hugging him. We were still hanging out, but like. He doesn't live right on my lap and like put his head against me all the time, right? So I didn't get it from him, but I did catch it from Sage. So anyway, again, it wasn't super surprising, but I don't know. Hopefully any of that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I feel slightly embarrassed. Again, I don't know why I feel embarrassed, um, but I just wanted to share that. But yeah, seriously, get, get it, get it for your bug out bag. And also look at pictures and learn the signs. If your kid won't stop itching or if you can't stop itching, and you can go into the mirror too and kind of look and you'll see little whites, like little white eggs right there. That's actually the first place I found it on both my kids. Although Elliot's was much farther along before we caught his because we don't know, we didn't know anything. And he had so many at the base of his neck as well. Sage didn't have any, so that was awesome. We caught it early with her and we caught it super early with me because I, I didn't have a single egg that I found, um, but I did have couple little stowaways on there so hopefully I caught them before they did anything on my head <laughs> gosh so gross we're just gonna continue combs every single day treatments and you know make sure that we're super clean and then when I have to go out I'm just basically gonna stick a thing on my head and yeah kind of go from there so anyway that's kind of what's going on with me and also why I didn't manage to make a lot of videos this week between the hurt back and the horror. Um, but yeah, anyway. Okay. That's all. As always, I hope the rest of your day is good and your life stays wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Bye.